All right, thanks for all of attended and joined this morning. Just a few more minutes while we get some more participants here and we'll start here shortly. Those of you that are listening, also the Q&A section will follow this training. So please submit all your questions via chat and we'll make sure that we address those as we go along. Yeah, we'll do our best to answer all the questions. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot, but one of the things we wanna talk about is just introducing uh, commercial solar uh, sales training. So this is a, a very rudimentary, it's a 101 session. Next week, we're going to get into a 201 session, which really talks more about pricing and constructability and customer expectations, including schedules. So you guys are aware and you can talk the talk and give the sales confidence that you need to pitch a commercial project versus a residential. So the next week on May 13th, we're going to get into 301. So that's going to have to do with uh, financing, all different types of products. There's quite a few of them. We're going to get into medium depth in that. We don't want to go too in depth in terms of backend structuring, investment capital, and you know partnership flips and all that. We just want to keep it high level. But we want to arm you guys with everything you need to know in financing so you know which project fits which financing you get the right information, the right questions and things go smoother. We want to separate these three. So if you do have questions at the end, obviously we want to make sure that you might get a reply that says, Hey, that's a 301 question or that's a 201 question join. Cause we just don't want to get you drinking from a fire hose. Um, we only have about an hour. We want to respect your time. So with that said, I think we can jump into it. So wel welcome everybody, I appreciate your time. And uh, this is the first time I've done commercial solar sales training, but I've done it for 13 years, uh, both in EPC and sales and finance. So one of the things that we can go over real quick is who I am and whoever it is. These are your presenters. Uh, my name is John McDonald. I'm the founder and CEO of WattHub. We formed WattHub in 2011 because we saw everybody going to everybody, going to everybody, trying to connect, and they were getting lost in middlemen. So we put up a bid and list platform together so you can go direct, or if you need us to develop your projects, because that's what we're really good at, we can do that as well. Uh, I also founded and partner in Sun Renew Solar, which is an Arizona-based uh, EPC, engineering procurement construction company. We have all my experience of turning wrenches from doing every type of project, ground mount, roof mount, carports, building integrated photovoltaics, uh, and some crazy superstructures all come from uh, Sun Renew Solar. So that really gives the knowledge base of constructability and how that works into financing. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur, a solar investor. Uh, I own and operate about seven solar assets and they're small, but I don't like paying taxes, so it's really fun for me. Uh, investor in a couple of different industries, and uh, one of them is, is whiskey, which is a little bit more fun than solar. <laughs> Just kidding. But I we put our emails down, so you email us any questions that you have. But again, once we get through the entire series, the 201 and 301, we'll, we'll have a really broad knowledge base, and hopefully you pick up some gems that 
you can really talk the talk when you're speaking with the customer. Everett Brewer, a partner in, in Wadhub, he helped co-found it back in 2011. I'll let him talk about his experience and how it pertains to commercial solar. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your guys' time and, and uh, yeah, a little about myself. So I'm originally from Arizona. We, uh, my background actually comes from uh, industrial and commercial construction. So I used to build fabrication buildings for Intel and Motorola. I also did the addition on Caesars Palace and also built the Wind Casino. And so with that construction experience, it's allowed me to liaison over into the energy space with renewable energy and allowed me to get on, on uh, you know, this space with John, um, which I'm appreciative for. Um, I also am the, uh, the founder of Stores Power. So we're on the energy storage side, very familiar with the battery storage from microgrid to um, uh, utility scale projects all the way down to the residential area. And then of course, uh, we're heavily involved in the automation control side um, of the business as well that really layers on in all levels of renewable energy from PV to ESS to um, utility grade uh, services all the way down to the end. So what allows us between combined uh, experiences, we can really touch on a lot of different categories um, throughout this renewable energy industry and uh, really support from many different facets of education and true application. Go ahead, John. All right, so who the heck is Wathub? Like I said, we, we built this to go direct because there was a lot of uh, middlemen and brokers and, and brokers are great uh, when they add value, but when they don't, that's when you get caught doing commercial deal and paying seven different people. It's a similar situation of residential referral fees and so forth. So we built a platform. It's a, a, a direct platform. You list a project and the bidder uh, puts a bid. It's reverse auction based. So obviously we want the lowest DPC uh, cost possible so we get the best deal from the customer and and so forth so we built that we put that together in 2011 we went through multiple website iterations but all through that a lot of people said you know commercial is really complicated there's a lot of facets to it i need to make sure my underwriting is correct my analysis is correct my proposal is correct and so we've been taking over and doing a lot of development for uh, residential sales organizations channel partners uh, and even other EPCs that focus on residential. All we've done is commercial, so this is all we know. Uh, we've consulted on large scale, you know, utility, 100 megawatt project, but really our sweet spot is between 50 uh, kilowatts and a megawatt. We do a lot of those projects. Uh, the higher the project, the easier it is to finance actually, but the where we found success is putting together 50, 100, 150, 500 kilowatt projects and financing them uh, through third parties, accredited investors, uh, PPA companies, and making sure everything goes smoothly. So one of the things we wanted to do today is introduce you as to Chris. Chris Leonard is the account manager, and so he is your first line of contact. So he is the guy that puts it all together and makes this wheel turn. So if you have questions, if you have needs, if you have any uh, project questions, he can filter you to the right people. So Chris, are you unmuted? Yeah. All right. Yep. Introduce yourself and let everybody know what you do. Awesome. Hey guys, appreciate everybody jumping on. John Everett, uh, great introduction there. Um, super excited to chat with you guys. I'm the account manager for Wathub. I'll be your main point of contact, like John said. Um, my job is to help you with your needs on your commercial projects, whether that's helping you connect you with financing, engineering, installers in states where maybe you're an uh, not an installer, um, connect you with manufacturers, distributors. Uh, we can also help you develop a commercial project. Basically, what that means is get proposals, designs uh, uh, for these clients. Uh, we also can help sell these clients with you. Uh, and so my job is to help you be successful with your commercial projects. Um, you know, and I work pretty hard to, to make sure you guys and your clients are taken care of. Um, you can reach me at chris at watthub.com. Um, and anytime you sign up on Watthub or click on the get started, if you haven't already, um, you'll be hearing from me and I'll be reaching out to you um, most likely every month to see how you're doing and see what we can do to help you. Thanks guys. 
Excellent. A little bit more about our expertise and background is Everett, you can talk about this. Uh, he's got the experience in the energy efficiency controls battery. Uh, he's the technology wizard uh, behind Wathub. So go ahead. And yeah, absolutely. And, and just kind of preference this slide here is, um, you know, 80% of a commercial project is development and underwriting. Um, underwriting we're going to get into in, in future trainings. But 80% of our job is really focused there. And to really understand how to properly develop a project, you really got to understand the different aspects of technologies, different aspects of goals and alignment with the customer, and different aspects with funding vehicles that can help uh, support those goals of that end client. And so we're very proficient in these areas. And of course, there's, there's many different options within these, these different categories of business. You know, the utility scale projects are going to be different than governmental your RFPs are going to have different criteria that are preset sometimes by somebody that has experience with a renewable energy or might just be new and kind of just throwing stuff to see what sticks. A nonprofit, of course, is something that we really heavily focus in. As, as many of you guys may know, 70% of the projects we do nationally are in that nonprofit category, which we'll reference um, future in the slide. We also are proficient in grant underwriting that can come all the way down from Department of Energy for tribal entities. Um, down into the, uh, the uh, REAP grants and so on and so forth. And that really comes down to an expertise of understanding how to manipulate and understand the language from a governmental or third party entity, and able to speak that communication and make sure that the project can fit those alignment and goals and have the least path resistance to qualify for those grant processes. Of course, commercial industrial, um, a big uh, piece that actually enables our industry to move is the tax equity aspect, especially when it comes to a, a nonprofit entity or a non-taxable entity that, that drives our business. And then, of course, energy efficiency is a major piece. One of the major goals that we reference here is reduce before you produce. Um, as many of you know, energy efficiency in the commercial space is about half the cost reducing a lot than producing a lot. And in many markets across America where commercial rate schedules are very different, um, that cost reduction is very key on actually getting that project to move forward where it can pencil and can meet the financial goals of the client in association with certain financing options. And we also specialize in building management systems, um, artificial intelligence and, and IOT. So our ability to control a building's energy load is very important in comparison to just trying to be reactive to it. Um, the predictive aspect allows us to really kill demand charges and be more effective. And then of course, energy storage is a major piece of that in the case that it pencils. And we'll do future trainings on energy storage and where that does and does not apply and why it can be a benefit and sometimes it can be a detriment. We see a lot of folks that are just throwing energy storage on every installation but reality is, is that that's actually hurting the model and says supporting it. So the overall experience from us uh, throughout the USA, where our entire uh, footprint here is we've got 25 years plus of experience um, amongst all of our team members in this position to really look at these projects holistically and find the right cocktail of services and products and technologies to make sure that it fits the financial thresholds and financial goals of the client. And uh, our ultimate goal here at Watt Hub, in addition with Chris as an account manager and, and John and I being on the, uh, on the development side is, is that our goal is to obviously educate you guys and all ships rise with the tide. Um, nothing makes it easier and, and uh, more enjoyable as we start building these relationships than being able to come through here, showing you the reason why we're offering a certain way it is, and then moving over to a position where you guys can then duplicate that information as you move forward. So with over 13 years of experience, um, we've actually seen over a billion dollars of projects that's processed through Watt Hub. So we're proud of that. And uh, to say we did that by ourselves would be a lie. We've got a lot of great collaboration with a lot of great minds in those positions. We've also, uh, we have over 3,800 channel partners nationally that use Watt Hub in some way, shape or form, whether that's filling the gaps of uh, where there's a process of the fulfilling an entire project that they're not proficient in to supporting a full turnkey installation in those regards. So we're happy to actually take that experience and, and continue that to grow. We've personally installed over 400 megawatts of projects in this position. Um, you know, the tech platform is called Clean Connectivity. 
Uh, this world grows and ever changes every single day. And so our ability to take this ever changing market is allowing for all those manufacturers with te top technologies, all the proper EPCs, the 2300 EPC partners that we have inside of our platform that come with many different facets of, of uh, experience, the different financing options that are ever changing and progressing. These are the things that we can actually go and you guys can leverage our expertise and our relationships through that connected every platform through WattHub. Our finance options, we have over 21 different underwriting types and multiple terms within. And that gets very strategic on making sure you're finding the right vehicle for the client. Um, unlike residential, where they're just off the shelf, 20 and 25 year terms at 299, very simple off the shelf. Financing is very custom in our world. Um, it uh, doesn't come down to just running a basic credit check. You've got to go through additional underwriting options. And sometimes those underwriting can happen within a couple weeks. Sometimes it can happen within 90 days, sometimes longer than that, depending on certain jurisdictions. Um, so our experience in financial underwriting and expertise really helps in association with all the legal documents that are associated. Each state is different in the commercial world. So really able to leverage our, uh, just the legal aspect and agreement aspects is very, very important as well. And then, um, you know, one's, one's really important here on the commercial, where your, your commercial sales arm, we're here to literally align right there with you. Um, as Chris met reference to you, we're happy to jump on these calls with you and help present these, these type of projects, uh, especially as you guys are getting into new territory potentially or new underwriting options or more new design aspects, um, newer technologies that help, uh, support the electric bill savings for those clients. So don't be afraid to call on us to where we can sit side by side, locked arm and go through there and tackle this, these uh, commercial projects together. All right, so course outline, we're gonna go through this uh, pretty quickly. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is avoiding cost of energy, uh, production modeling, commercial solar design, EPC vetting, working with a board versus a homeowner, and sale and wrap it up with sales confidence the number one aspect of what we do is is avoided cost of energy there's a lot of folks out there that don't fully understand it you need to pull out the demand based uh, charges and there could be a lot of them so we're going to show you examples of how to underwrite and the difference between average cost of energy and avoided cost of energy could be a deal that you had that you thought you had that died because they had too low of avoided cost of energy. So this is the single most important facet of what we do is getting this right because avoided cost of energy dictates the deal and I'll let Everett go through uh, the avoided cost and how we determine that. Absolutely. So in this situation, as John references, avoided cost drives our industry, that industry being commercial, industrial, utility scale, all the way up to the very top. And where these facets really come into is, is unlike residential, residential rate scales are fairly simple for the most part in most markets. You simply have a cost of energy, a cost per kilowatt hour. There might be a time of use aspect associated, but it's still a cost per kilowatt hour and one that's being generated. And then also, you know, your, your basic billing and statement fees. And so when we go to do a residential installation, we can go through and produce 100% of their kilowatt hours and offset 92 to 100% of their actual bill. They might just have maybe a basic statement fee uh, at the end of the day. So that's where the conveniences come in on a residential statement over the fact of commercial. Where commercial has additional facets and, and aspects, as you can see as an example of a statement here from an Arizona utility, as you can see, you've got fixed charges. They, uh, fixed charges for commercial billing, um, they are, do not change post-solar. So that's what we call a non-bypassable charge in, in our, our industry. The next set of charges are demand-based charges. So these are positions to where they either have um, for peak, peak usage for that month. So a quick example, a utility company looks at the energy usage in 15 minute intervals of time. And the highest peak usage in any 15 minute period for that billing section actually dictates the kilowatts of usage needed in that peak, which turns into a surcharge. Now those surcharges demand can be on a time of use demand aspect, or it can be a singular demand aspect, but the, where that, what solar can and cannot do is really dictated based off of when those spikes are happening and how they're using that energy. 
and whether or not solar can or cannot reduce those costs. Then you actually have one thing. I, go ahead. Oh, one, one thing I want to jump in and just point out is some, some rate plans across the country have line items like environmental benefit surcharge and federal transmission of ancillary services. You'd never know they were demand based. So that's where, you know, that's 15% of the energy bill just in those two line items alone and having them demand based. So you have to take them out of the underwriting equation, which severely co uh, changes avoided costs. So knowing all of this and having the right software and tools to dial in avoided costs is very, uh, it's important. Absolutely. Yeah, and in addition to there is, is that uh, what the term avoided cost simply means is, is that what part of the bill can we avoid by going solar and what part can we? So an example of this statement right here, um, after running a development of this position, even though we're offsetting 100% of their kilowatt hour usage for the day and for the year, what happens is, is that we actually only touch 63% of their bill. So their avoided cost, if you look to just simple numbers, if you looked at a 10 cent kilowatt hour overall price per the entire statement, then what happens is, is that you can only avoid 6.3 cents, meaning as a utility company is still gonna get their 3.3 cents a, uh, a kilowatt hour in those additional auxiliary services charges, um, the transmission deli delivery, the demand charges and statement fees. So that does vary in that aspect and where that comes in. A quick example, there was actually two projects down in, in Southern California. And what we identified is, is that it's not only the fact of how they use their power is when they use their power. And what we identified was, is that the avoided cost of one of those clients was only 3.4 cents because they use very high spikes of energy at night where solar cannot offset those big spikes and how they ran their facility. The other client where avoided cost is around 7 cents. And considering the cost of build for that rooftop and that rooftop plus canopy um, installation, their payback periods were 13 and 17 years. It was actually not a good project for them to look at renewable overall. Uh, maybe the suggestion would be is just going and looking at maybe some energy efficiency reductions from LED, more efficient HVAC units, et cetera. So we did our best to try to educate that client and saying is like, hey, solar is not the right fit for you in this regard um, because it's just not a good investment. Now we found out that uh, about four months later, five, well about six months later, we had a, a partner call us and said, uh, got to know who Watt Hub is, is, and, is, and then what he says like, wait a minute, I actually know who you are. I installed two projects you couldn't do. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm one to always find ways to learn and do better. Please enlighten me. What, what, how did you move forward with those projects? So I identified that they were those two projects and the price per watt they sold those clients at were much higher. And I said, well, this is the background. This is why we didn't move forward. Well, unfortunately there's consumer protection laws out there um, that's fortunate for the end user. And both those businesses actually ended up going after that customer or after that company and unfortunately had to shut their doors because solar was not the right fit. And the approach they had taken is they didn't account for avoided costs. They accounted more of a residential approach to where, oh yeah, we're gonna avoid your entire utility bill. Solar is gonna be great. Made them look like a spreadsheet millionaire. And so how we actually make sure the accuracy of that happens is many of your markets you guys in, California being one of them, uh, there's available information called interval data. So this actually gives us the spreadsheet in the background here is actually an example set of it. It gives us the exact amount of power used every 15 minutes. So it allows us to know if that solar bell curve or that battery discharge aligns perfectly with when those big spikes of energy are or what that spike was in the middle of the day and then what their running watts are at night. So these are things that come into effect on developing these projects on getting a very strategic and, and accurate plan uh, and according to finding the best solution for that customer. And this is the only way to know that if solar can offset some demand charges, because we know that it can, I've, I've physically seen it, we, we model it in certain cases, but if you're just looking at raw bills and you don't have interval data, you have to take all the demand charges out and throw it out, which obviously comes up with a lower cost of energy. 
the 15 minute interval data shows how much energy they use and when, and if it's when the solar is producing, it will reduce their demand charge a lot, a little, it's all determined on their energy use profile. But this is important because again, it falls back to, do I have a deal or do I not have a deal? Absolutely. And this avoided cost number to take it further is really able to identify the profitability potential of the project and also identify the options for different underwriting options, whether that's a uh, power purchase agreement, a solar service agreement, loans, cap lease, off lease, true lease, prepaid PPA, all the different 21 underwriting types that we're familiarized with is because if their avoided cost is lower, then of course you're gonna to have to come in at a lower price per watt. If their avoided cost is higher, you can come in at a higher price per watt and make sure that that client still has a good proper uh, payback during those timelines. And we'll get into that into the future trainings and how to take that avoided cost and how to convert that into the proper underwriting type for the client in that regard, making sure you're not at risk as a business and the customer is not at risk as a owner of the asset. Yep. And next series, next Wednesday, we're going to talk about constructability and that has everything to do with avoided costs. So we'll bring it back. Uh, you know, if, if a customer has a seven cent avoided cost and they want all carports, not going to fly. So we're going to talk a little bit about production modeling next. And you guys, I'm, I'm assuming everyone on the, on the call has done some production modeling before, whether you use PV Watts, PV Sys, Helioscope, or energy tool base, which are the usual suspects. What we, we, we use uh, PV Watts quite a bit. We've, we've used PV Sist. It's a, a license that you buy. It's expensive and it overstates production every single time. So it's crap in, crap out. We like PV Watts. It's free. We know what efficiency losses to put in. And so whether it be rooftop or ground mount or carport, long runs, you know, add to voltage drop and things like that. So every couple hundred feet, there's, you know, 0.2% of voltage drop unless you oversize conductors and, you know, change up the engineering. But PV watts between 10 and 12% losses are, you're in the safe zone there. So if you're running, I've seen companies run it at 4% losses. I've seen companies run it at 20% losses. And depending on the application, which it does vary, but between 10 and 12% is what you'll really see uh, in production post solar. Um, so you put in the right parameters, what, where it's facing, what's the tilt, and it'll, it'll spit out a, a pretty accurate design. Uh, Helioscope is notorious for overstating production because they have a default condition set. How you fix that is you come up with your own condition set and I can uh, basically increase uh, losses in that section to five or six and then you're, you're again in the safe zone. Uh, ETB is robust. Uh, Everett can talk a little bit about this. Is this is where you upload the interval data. You can see exactly what the avoided cost is, exactly how much demand it could potentially offset. Now this is, obviously there's an asterisk there because if there's peak demand and it's cloudy out, then they still get hit with that charge. So that's why we have to typically throw out those demand-based charges. Absolutely. And, and where energy tool base really comes in, why we've been happy with that platform mm -hmm. is simply because they actually have been known for having the most accurate rate schedules. So when we account for layering in the energy modeling or the energy usage with that 15 minute interval data, for example, that allows us to properly understand how and when those charges are going to be assessed and then what areas that we can improve, whether that's coming from a renewable source coming from an energy storage device or a reduction project where we're doing energy efficiency, automation or controls, and uh, really being able to look at those components. Um, there still needs to be some input aspect with energy tool base. Um, it automatically defaults to some uh, basic settings, and that's where the development really comes into play. Um, you know, as, as John referenced in Helioscope and, and PV Assist, and even in PV Watts, you've got to come in there and actually know some of the condition sets. And if you're not aware of that, just please leverage us in, in those positions. We can happily help run those modeling as being a partner with WattHub. Um, and so that way you're not going to be overstating production, which could be a, a major detriment to your credibility as a business and offering. 
or understating the production, which then may limit some of the financing options for that client or limit some of the overall feasibility of the project. We've seen some default settings come out of some of these designs from some of our partners that have tried to hit some of those triggers. And unfortunately, um, the loss of production actually makes it look really bad and the project doesn't look like a pencil. So we come in there and help with those corrections. So don't be bashful. Um, you know, this is an ever-changing industry and, and there's lots of love uh, aspects to this, but these condition sense really come into effect in uh, overall production modeling. It's not just spit out like residential. All right, so we're going a little bit into commercial solar design and design meaning not just a layout. Um, it's you're looking at single phase versus three phase. Uh, 208 versus 480 on the main service. That's important only because that has to do, everything to do with the inverter. And 208 inverters are approximately 50% more expensive than 480 because 480 you could fit uh, a, a large size in a box where 208 is limited to about 15 kilowatts on an inverter if you're going with 208 inverters. So available breaker space uh, versus line side tap and pictures are key. It, Chris, is that you? Uh, it looks like it might be uh, somebody else. Can everybody make sure their lines are muted? Yes, please. So getting into further into pictures, you guys are, a lot of people are doing the sales on this and I want to talk about just a couple of important photos because this has to do with the design of the system. So it's the inverters, it's the stringing, it's optimizers, it's everything downstream and the entire one line or single line diagram. So the important photos are the three that are on the screen right now. You're going to want to get a picture of the full cabinet. So that will tell us if there's an open breaker space that you can jump into. That's the least expensive way to interconnect if there's an open breaker space. You wanna get a picture of the nameplate rating of the main service. And the main service is often called an SES, a service entrance section. So if you hear that nomenclature, it, they're just talking about the main service panel. Uh, the nameplate rating also brings to light if it's a 480 to 277, which again dictates where the inverters are. If it's a 208 service, you can still use 480 inverters to get a low cost, but you have to install a transformer. And transformers are costly to install. It's another piece of equipment. That's usually cost effective in a 300 kilowatt project and above. That if it's a 208 service, you want to use 480 inverters, install a transformer and connect to the 208 service. Uh, 300 kilowatts and above. Anything below that, you're, you're really stuck with using the 14 or 15 kilowatt inverters that, that are 208. And then you obviously want to get a picture of the meter, the meter number. And uh, you're on site. So these are pictures that we would love for you to get if you're, if you're sending it to us for development, because this we can't tell everything from these pictures, but it is uh, head and shoulders above nothing. Uh, so if we're guessing on 480 versus 208, we're trying to estimate this for you and price it, then we have to make guesses and it's always better with a little bit of information. So if you're on site, just saying, you know, hey, at the end of this meeting, do you mind if I just snap a quick photo of your uh, main service panel? Just take a couple photos, that's it. If you do get up on the roof, take a photo of obstructions, uh, measure uh, uh, mechanical equipment heights, measure parapet heights. Um, it's not necessary. A lot can be determined from an aerial imagery and aerial photographs of projects, but the main service is a key element to get while you're on site. And so it really helps show that the homeowner, or the, I'm sorry, not the homeowner, the uh, the owner of the project that you're, you're serious about putting together a hard proposal for them. Talk a little bit about solar carports. Uh, gosh, we've built everything over the years. Uh, you know, tea canopies, 
are the dual head-to-head -head spaces that are the least expensive. So we're going to get more into this in the 201. So I'm going to kind of breeze over this. Uh, you got your semi cantilever, which is uh, just a portion of cantilever on one side and a long portion of cantilever on the other side. It's, it's single space uh, parking, a little bit more expensive. And then full cantilever, what that means is just an it's a reverse L. It's column up, beam over, and that's usually fairly expensive because the stress on the beam requires it to be upsized because it's all cantilever on one side only. A uh, little bit about fire sprinkler rules. This is kind of a crapshoot. So every authority is having jurisdiction. Every city, every county has their own rules for fire sprinklers. If you're close enough to a building, they could say, you know, you need to be fire sprinklered. If your canopy length is too long, they could say you have fire sprinklers. And this is in parking lots too. So we've come across everything use our expertise to get around this. Now we can't know every city and county's requirements, but a good rule of thumb is 8,500 square feet of canopy usually triggers something uh, regarding fire sprinklers. So if you're just doing one massive structure and it's long, it's 500 feet long and 40 feet wide, you're, you're over that threshold. So just put a couple gaps in there and usually it's four to five feet of spacing and again, if we're doing this for you, you'll see this in our designs. A common question on carports is, hey, I wanna put solar on my existing carports. Well, I'm sorry, you can't, typically. Unless the owner of the, the facility has plans and it can show that it was engineered for solar, 99.9% .9 of the time, you cannot retrofit existing canopies. The footings aren't deep enough and it's not the downward weight it's the upward lift that is the issue there. So steel fab lead times, uh, assuming you get a contract, assuming EPC is in place, EPC says, let's go and gives notice to proceed to the steel guy, three to four weeks to fabricate the steel and get it on site. So there's a month uh, time that we're gonna talk about in 201 in terms of uh, expectation setting with clients and schedule, because you wanna sound like you, know exactly what you're doing in commercial and then the general cost of solar carports there on the west so california arizona new mexico colorado you're going to see it be a, a little bit cheaper once you get into the snow loads of like northern colorado and new england and so forth you're going to see a lot more expense in the steel category we we've seen them as low as 40 cents on a typical you know 300 kilowatt project up to about 80 cents a watt is an adder so it's a it's a big jump if you're want if looking for carports so this all falls back to avoided cost is if their avoided cost is low and they want carports you got to know that it may or may not work and so you can talk to a, the customer about hey your avoided cost is really low you don't get the luxury of that unless you pony up some money rooftop designs a lot of flat roofs a lot of pitch roofs uh, ballast is our go-to. I know some designers and installers like to penetrate flat roofs. We do not. It's just a preference. It doesn't make one right or wrong. We do a lot of ballast. It's extra engineering. It's a little bit extra time uh, for ballast weight calculations and structural engineering. But on larger projects, I would rather not punch the roof 150 times or 500 times than just put an interconnected series of racking up there, uh, weighted down by block. Uh, fire access is four feet. A new California code that just got instituted is four feet around skylights too, so you can't encroach them. Uh, and again, every HJ or city or town or county, wherever you're pulling the permit, has their own requirements. So you're going to run into new stuff. They always have comments. Uh, I've seen probably 10% of the time that we've submitted for a commercial permit that they said, oh, great, yep, you're approved, good to go. They always come back with comments and it could be as small as, hey, your placard needs to say this and not that. But then you have to resubmit and there's another two weeks. So NEC 17 is starting the Institute everywhere. It's already in California. It's creeping into Arizona and all throughout the country. 
And NEC 17 is rapid module level shutdown. So your end phases, your solar edges, and your SMAs with optimizers, the Tygos, can handle all of this stuff. And CPS has their own rapid shutdown. I think they might use a Tygo too, but this goes into design. Just use it as a given that there's going to be some sort of device on each panel or on every other panel. Ground mount, we've, we've built uh, fencing requirements that include the cost of the fencing, which could run anywhere between two and eight cents a watt, depending on how big the project is. Uh, your inter row spacing depends on your tilt angle. And then the age old question is, is tracking versus fixed tilt better? Uh, we've, again, we've done both. Uh, it's, it's not a, a preference. We, I personally like fixed tilt only because there's no mechanical. Solar just works. You put it up, it works. You may have to change an inverter fuse or change out an inverter a few years down the line, but uh, mechanical, if you get a, a motor that breaks, then you got to go out and fix that. There's a little bit more maintenance involved, but it does increase production about 20% for single axis tracking. So if you're doing a PPA and it's, it's uh, more lucrative, you'll probably make more money with trackers on an EPC price than you will with fixed tilt. You also want so to there, fixed tilt or, or over tracking as well on the account of your environment. So understanding your soil types, understanding your, you know, your dust, your sediment, all those aspects that actually come down to the breakdown of those mechanical devices that goes into your operations and maintenance cost overall. So just keep that in mind. And if you need some input on that, again, uh, lean on Watt Hub and we can help uh, bring, shed some light in, in accordance to all the project details and what make, may make more or less sense. And one of the last things we talk about, uh, we get approached all the time with, hey, I've got a landowner, it's got 500 acres, who wants to do a solar farm. That's wonderful. We, we we want to build solar farms. We want to get more clean energy deployed. That's the goal. But if they don't have an off taker, there's no deal. So if you if you have customers that have landowners like, hey, I, I've got land. I'll put solar, and I, I want a land lease, and I want you guys to put build a solar farm. You win, I win, everyone wins. You got to have an off taker. And if you're not in a state that has community solar, or if you're not in a state that has virtual net metering. It's wildly difficult to get a utility to say, yes, I will buy that energy from you unless you have already pre-existing conversations with them or you're wheeling the power to the neighbor and the utility company allows that, which many of them don't. Uh, there's really no deal. So if you, in terms of bringing this up to save some time, if, if somebody approaches you and says, I got a thousand acres, I want to build a solar farm. Well, we can do that, but where's the power going to go? That's the first question to ask. So we want to talk a little bit about EPC verification. This is wildly important, and we have some crazy nightmare stories. We've used bad contractors. We, we've made every mistake in the book, so we've learned from our mistakes over the past 13 years. We've even funded projects for an EPC that gave us a fake statement of qualifications and botch the project. So EPC verification, if you're selling a deal, you want to do your homework on it. You want to check the company. You want to check licensing. You want to check their statement of qualifications. Are they a, a BBB member? Google is your friend in this case. You just have to know where to look. So one example is we had somebody approach us and say, hey, I, I want to build your projects. We said, all right, well, you know, send me your statement of qualifications. And they didn't. And then they got real mad. They got real mouthy with us. They're like, oh, you guys are just trash and scum and blah, blah, blah. And he started mouthing off to, to Chris. So I jumped in there. I'm like, look, buddy, I did some research on you. You have no company. It was not registered in California. And the Colorado co company was expired. So he had no company. He had no ROC license. He had a website. And oftentimes you'll get these guys and you might even get somebody to bid on a project that isn't really uh, an established vetted company. And so you got to be careful of that. So you do your homework. You got to know where to look. You look, at, for example, a California business search. You want to check their, to see if they're a company, see if they're a new company. 
Uh, you also want to check to see if they have a license and if that license is in good standing, if they have any uh, complaints on their license. Uh, check their BBB and have somebody send a statement of qualification that is not a Word document with two paragraphs. So you want somebody that has their stuff together to build your project because you want somebody to represent the project as they represent you to the customer. Another aspect and we could help um, oh, go ahead, is uh, a lot of times um, you'll find a local contractor that has done many projects locally, but 95% of their experience is in residential. And so what you're going to have in barriers of entry challenges there is that their ability to price and build a commercial project at commercial pricing based around some of those aspects of avoided costs where you have to get more aggressive on the, on the EPC price and also for the aspects of experience from an electrical standpoint. We've had many a, a, a client that we've approached where they're looking at using us as, as one of the bids or one of our channel partners that have bids. And the client has a couple different proposals from a few different companies. And your number one identifier typically is if you start seeing commercial products above $3 a watt, there's your, your quick answer on understanding that they, that installer has a residential background. Um, you're not going to see with any good reason unless you're doing something extravagant on a project um, that's above three bucks a watt. That's anything that's 100 kW or larger. Uh, those projects just don't run that high. And you'll see a lot of these residential companies that will come in from that standpoint that, that uh, really is going to put the customer in a bad position because typically they don't run the avoided cost numbers correctly and then of course they're overpriced. If we could help you with this, if you say, hey, I've got this project and I want to use this installer, we run some research on them. It takes me 10 minutes to do that. We'll find out. Really, the answer is, do they hold their ROC license as they hold their word as it, as it is their bond? If you see that uh, qualifying party have 10 different ROC licenses that are all expired, he's bouncing from company to company to company to company. Maybe a, a a good idea to stay away from that. So certain red flags, let us help you do some research and make sure that you get a, a smooth project. Cause the last thing you need is to enforce the contract that kicks them off the job. And then you have to bring in a new uh, contractor. And in most contract law, it says uh, the first contractor is at the expense of bringing in the new contractor. So, but just going through the rigmarole of that is not worth it. So you just want to do a little bit of homework up front. Yeah, now Everett, do you want to jump in? Absolutely. So this is where the the fun part, uh, we'll call it that for, for the purposes of this meeting comes into play. So working with a, a board versus a homeowner, um, nothing's better than sitting down at the kitchen table from a residential standpoint and working with both decision makers, which is where 80% of their decisions are made, is at that kitchen table. And being able to take a project from A to Z, sign contracts, schedule side, audit, approved financing. In the real world of commercial, that doesn't exist. Uh, the reality of it is, is that we do an average of 36 touches per customer um, on the commercial side before we get to what we call the, the stage of a letter of intent. We actually don't even issue an agreement uh, right out of the grade. An example is, is that we had a client that was a, a large church. And within that church, um, their board decision took nine months. Uh, for them to make that decision. For, because of that, they had a general board, they had a finance board, they had an executive board, and then they also had their CPAs and accountants on the back end addition. So welcome to our world of uh, multi-hand processes. Um, so one of the things to set some expectations of is, is when you look at getting into the commercial industry, if you're not already, and looking at the different profitability aspects of that, you need to account realistically for that additional maintenance and time of hand-holding that relationship through those different points of execution. Those different points of execution are simply this. We go from a requesting energy usage to creating a design and proposal um, off of their energy modeling and typically with an indicative financing prices in association with that. 
documents. Once we have that, we then then present to the board or to the multiple boards across that uh, or amongst multiple decisions or multiple screen shares in those examples. Once the board has agreed to move forward, we first start with a letter of intent. That letter of intent is an exclusivity agreement. That exclusive is exclusivity agreement. It really applies on both our sides. WhatHub is happy to support that from a document standpoint. It's a simple two page document. Um, it says, hey, you're our boys. You're the ones that we want to work with. And then that way, they're not getting bids from other suppliers as you start putting in the real time and money of putting boots on the ground. After the letter of intent is in place, then we're gonna request their financials. Just so you're aware, 98% of our projects actually uh, uh, need some type of financing vehicles, what we've recognized year over year. Very few cash customers. I believe we ran some data for 2019, and in this position, we, uh, uh, in this position, we, we had a 0.2% closing percentage for cash clients. It's very, very, very low. And so um, we'll request those financials, do that financial review, and then schedule for the proper audits. We'll come out and do the electrical, the structural, um, any of the uh, environmental aspects that associate with that project, or we recommend you to if that's your position within our relationship and partnership with WattHub. And then once that information's come back, pre-engineering, financials approved, which financing can take anywhere from two weeks up to 90 days or, or sometimes longer in rare occasions, then we're gonna execute on an actual agreement. And then again, welcome to the board again. You get a full introduction to the whole board uh, for uh, multiple times. In this position, they'll put their attorneys on it, of course, and look at the different aspects of those agreements. Many types of these agreements are very standardized, so it's very easy to digest. Other ways, there might be ones that the agreements are a little more complicated, they have a little more facets to them. And sometimes you have to do multiple calls for them to just kind of grasp the underwriting aspect that puts them in the best position. So these are things that we all come into being and being with a partner with WattHub, we are happy to support those timelines. We are used to that nine to 14 month lead into uh, agreement sign timeline and those aspects. We're used to the cash flow aspects associated um, with knowing that those projects come in a little bit later. Uh, residential is churn and burn. Um, I, I saw a post yesterday, there was a partner that said, hey, I, I had a, a project installed five days after a, a contract was signed. That was permit in hand, ready to mobilize. You know, those are very easy cash flow aspects in that regard. If you're in that position where that's how you keep meat on the table, WattHub's a great partner. You can now acquire those commercial projects without any concern of what's going to detriment your time. Just imagine how many resi deals you'll, you'll have to walk away from or not be able to approach doing 36 touches just to a letter of intent. Um, if that's your business currently doing commercial, you know exactly what we're talking about and we can help put those, uh, uh, shorten those timelines with you in that regard. Another aspect of working with a board versus a homeowner, <coughs> and it could be just uh, an owner of a building. It could be a, a self-employed uh, uh, small business. It could be a large school. And we'll get into what is recommended that you spend your time on prospecting if you're gonna enter the commercial space. But you're gonna want to talk to the CEO, you're gonna to wanna to talk to the CFO is a great starting point. They handle the money. So they, you guys know how to sell already. You guys are fantastic at that. And so giving the CFO a, an idea and making it his idea, that, oh, we can save money through solar is a great place to start because he can convince the CEO. You always wanna start high and get pushed down. You're gonna be working with the facilities director on where the solar is gonna go how it's gonna be interconnected and so forth. And we're gonna be alongside you side by side if you need it. If you don't, then prospect away, but start high and have them push you down to get the information that you need from the facilities director, admin for bills and so forth. But going up the other way is dramatically harder. So if you knew a facilities guy, having you get pushed up is a little bit more of an elongated process from our perspective. Absolutely. Everett, do you want to talk a little bit about sales confidence? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll just start off right out, of the, right out of the gate. A good barrier of entry getting into commercial solar is asking three simple questions. 
okay? And this is just, you can push this out to any of your sales teams, any, anything that you're first identifying here. Question number one, is your average utility bill 1,500 to $2,000 a month? Why that question is important is simply this. It's not a limitation that you and I can't go and install a 10 panel system, right? Our ability to physically install is never a limitation. The reason that I reference that is because that puts you about that 100 kilowatt solar system. There's some caveats in certain markets um, where you can go smaller than that. But the reason for that is because 98% of clients typically need some type of financing vehicle. Unfortunately, the commercial industry does not support that. Florida, California are really your exceptions. A little bit of Arizona where you have things like PACE financing where you get into smaller projects it's very expensive financing. It's actually the highest cost of, uh, of capital uh, nationally, but it's a position where you can really start acquiring some of those smaller projects in those positions. But that 100 kilowatt threshold is where you open up the other 20 of the 21 underwriting types that can start getting to where cash on cash ends up being a position of, of benefit. So it's a position where the electric bill savings is, bet, is, is uh, better than the, than the actual loan payment or the PPA payment or so on and so forth that's associated. So that's your number one identifier. Like I said, projects below a certain threshold, which is actually below 100 KW, they're typically cash customers and your closing percentage is 0.2% is what we've seen. And we see um, upwards of more than 150 projects a month here at WattHub through uh, different channels and in-house projects. And we know those that data just in and in out for the last 13 years. We've seen that repeat itself. So we keep in mind is question number one, is your average utility bill 1500 to $2,000? That'll give you confidence knowing that there'll be an end solution available, granted that they are financially stable in some way, shape or form. Question number two is, do you own the business or, um, uh, and own the building? So that really is where you get to that higher echelon point of contact. Like John referenced, the CFO is a great point. Um, your operations managers, uh, so on and so forth. And that way you can make sure that you're working with someone who's like, yeah, you know, I, I might just be the maintenance guy on the side. I've got this customer. Yeah, there might be some opportunity, but of course, just keep in mind, there might be a little bit more work to get into that. Owning the building as well is, is definitely key within that question. Um, it allows for access issues. Um, where a lot of times the funding options and then also the length of funding um, typically exceed the least, uh, the least terms of, of renting that building, even though they might be there for a long-term lease or. And then question number three, is it a freestanding building, meaning it's not inside of a, a strip mall or anything like that? There's a, sometimes there's obviously exceptions to that rule in very minor cases, but really what you run into is more of a jurisdiction issue. You're in a strip mall, you're gonna have roof jurisdiction issues in those positions to where, where the lines are defined on where we can put solar and typically in those plazas, they're actually very limited roof space. So we actually end up offsetting a very small amount of power. And so those are the three most commonly asked questions. And if they say yes, what a good, um, that'll allow you to have confidence going into the sales process, whether we're supporting you on any way, shape or form, or you guys are getting into this industry independently in the fact that you'll have confidence knowing that there'll be end solutions on the back end. And that's what's key. Too many times we have folks hit us up, say, hey, I've been trying to look for financing for this project for six months or two years, and I don't really know what to do with it and they send over the details and it's a 22 kilowatt, uh, you know, H&R block down the street and the customer has no cash and he's wondering why there's no loan options. That's why. Uh, it just doesn't meet those financial big, uh, thresholds and, and financing um, for small businesses is a high risk, unfortunately, in that position. Another aspect of confidence is, is that uh, being able to have the background and, and we really recommend going through all three of these courses. It's going to give you a lot of information on the back end to be able to talk with confidence, navigate those questions in the commercial industry. It's, it's a discovery process. There's no out of the box, off the shelf option. It's really, Hey, I asked this question. If they say yes or no, it takes to the left or the right. And being able to navigate that through these three trainings is what our goal is to enable you guys to, um, to be able to, uh, push through those those questions and concerns there. Excellent. So to play off of Everett's three common questions, 
what we boiled down from 13 years of experience is, is, is really this uh, common trends from a commercial deal. There needs to be a champion in the organization. Uh, hopefully that's a CEO, CFO, or somebody in, in a C-level position, but it, it doesn't need to be. We've gotten deals done where the facilities guy or the facilities gal is the champion. Energy managers for schools, big districts, they have uh, that position in place to approach. They're a great person to approach. The, the project needs to financially pencil. And what that means is this payment from whatever financing you're doing, which about 95% of commercial is finance some way, and there's a lot of different ways, but it needs to save the customer money. No financing company will do a, a deal that doesn't save them money. Everybody's, it, it increases what we call default risk. And what that is, is let's say you did a church and they really wanted carports, but they had low avoided cost and their PPA was above their avoided cost. So they're spending a little bit more for energy, but they justify it as, oh, we get shade and it's beautiful and it enhances the campus and yada, yada, yada. Five years later, there's a whole different regime of a board and they say, why are we paying more for energy? Let's cut that out. So there's your default risk. So the project needs to save money and the price needs to correlate to the avoided cost, which we, we spoke about. Customer financials, we do all the credit underwriting. We have a Moody's Risk Calc license. So we get balance sheets. So two years of balance sheets and three years of audited financial statements. So profit and loss statements are fine. You send that to us, we look at them. We can, we can tell if the project is investment grade. So you might've heard that term in commercial, you may have not. Essentially what the, it goes off of is uh, Moody's rating. So BAA3 is the bottom rung of investment grade, and it goes all the way up to AAA, which is the US government. Most cities, most towns, most school districts, you know, they're gonna be in the A1, A2, A3, which is the middle, and most churches are gonna be at the bottom. So BAA3 or BAA2. Uh, on their financials. Typically what we've seen is churches and nonprofit uh, religious organizations in general, they are very good stewards of money. So they have good balance sheets, have a lot of equity in the building. And I've only DQ'd, I think two or three churches in general on financials alone, not, not so much price in 13 years. So churches are good. A uh, customer needs confidence. They need confidence that you're you have the ability to get this done and it takes a team. Don't be shy and say, yes, we do everything in house. We have all the employees, you know, we do everything. If you're gonna use a different EPC, let them know that and just say, look, we have a couple of different EPCs that we use depending on their availability, uh, but they're all vetted, they're all quality um, and we oversee them throughout the entire project and hold your hand. They need confidence that you're gonna be able to do your job and it's okay to bring in a different EPC with a different name as long as you're upfront about it. What we do, because we're a developer, we don't have a license in every state across the country, we'll say, all right, we have a three-party agreement. Party number one, you customer. Party number two, us as the developer. Party number three is the EPC. And we could, we're happy to share that agreement with you uh, to get these things signed and get your name inside the contract. Oh, jumping. So knowledge is power. When you see a deal, it's extraordinarily complicated. Let's say it's a gas station and there's no room to put solar. Uh, the canopies in gas stations, 99% will not handle solar in terms of weight for structural. So things like that, if it gets really complicated, if they want super structures and their avoided cost is really low, we're in this business to not only help you be successful, but we also need to save your time because your time is val valuable. You make money, you put food on the table for your families. And if you can not put six months of your life into working a commercial project because it just doesn't work from the beginning, we will help you identify that. And has there been a deal done that we said, no, it's not, not a deal? Yes, there has. And, and that's unfortunate, but we've saved people years of their lives because we're like, hey, this is just not going to work or it's just, you're going to put in a year and for a, a low probability deal. So higher prices, low probability, 
uh, knowing when to walk away. Uh, we can help guide you. Not everybody takes our, our advice, but that's okay. Um, we want you guys to be successful. Double digit avoided costs is kind of a benchmark. If they have above 10 cents, so 10.1 cents, 12, 15, 18 cents, we've seen as high as 30 cents, but that's usually on very small commercial projects, which are the more difficult to fund. If you've got a big, massive mega church or a school district and they have a nine cent avoided cost, we could probably get that done. So a PPA or a, some sort of financing that has you know, eight and a half cents or less with a, a lower escalator than the utility. So that's a couple things to be aware of. A high probability projects. Keep in mind, this is for PPAs, and we're going to talk about financing in 301. But high probability projects are the mush market. So municipalities, universities, schools, churches, hospitals, they have investment grade credit. So if you're playing in that space, you rarely have to worry about will their credit stand on a PPA or financing company. So you can go ahead and look at their avoided cost and make sure that that's sufficient for the project that they want. Just to touch on uh, commercial, we've worked on a lot of commercial. We've built commercial, so investment properties such as office buildings, retail, strip centers, multifamily. Those are good customers, but they're difficult to finance. Why I say this is because if anybody here owns a commercial property, they don't want to pay taxes. So they run their business and they pay themselves you know, exorbitant management fees. So they run their asset to at least break even or maybe a little negative so they don't avoid taxes. That's a common trend in commercial real estate. And my prior experience prior to renewables is commercial real estate. So if you go to a lender and say, hey, this, my customer wants a, a loan and they don't show a profit, it doesn't look very good. Their bank is the number one place to go to. And it's okay to tell a customer, you have to go to your bank and you have to get financing because you're going to get a lot lower of a rate than we can get from somebody that doesn't know you. Banking is a relationship game. And so commercial can be done. Pace is a good option for commercial. All boils down to that avoided cost and whether it makes sense because pace is a great option if they are up on their property taxes and haven't missed any, but it also is, is fairly expensive money in terms of the seven to 8%, sometimes even 9% effective rate after the dealer fees. But again, getting ahead, we'll, we'll cover more of this in uh, 301 on May 13th. So the next series is 201. So Wednesday, May 6th, same time, we're going to go over commercial pricing and examples of that. So we're going to get into some products. We're going to get into some generic pricing uh, that you can put into your projects. So racking, carports, modules, all that stuff. Constructability, how difficult is the project to construct? If it's got a beautiful layout, but it's a thousand foot run, it affects constructability. Uh, setting client expectations, which we touched on today, we're going to get into a little bit more in depth. And then what everybody wants to know is market rate commissions. What can I make from selling a commercial project? And commercial project per watt is lower than residential, naturally, but you can still make some fantastic money. Uh, in that. So we'll talk about that and how you could add some elephants to your gazelles. Everett, if you want to wrap it all up and put it all together. Oh, it sounds good. I really appreciate everybody's time here. You know, our ultimate goal here as, as Watt Hub is to just elevate the industry as a whole. Um, I still feel like the commercial industry is very um, green at this point, And a lot of it comes from uh, a lot of folks started back in the Solar City Sunrun Vivint days from many, many years ago when solar really came on the map um, on the residential standpoint. And along that way, they've started trying to get into the commercial solar space. And, and some people have done it very successfully and others have had some bad experience, gotten back out, and we've allowed them to get back in. And so just know that we are happy to help on all facets. Um, we're not here to just own and operate everything. Uh, WattHub is a service. WattHub is a community. WattHub is a, is a network and a renewable energy exchange to make sure that we have all the people together. It takes a village to 
to raise these systems up and we're happy to make sure we collaborate with them um, overall. So again, thank you for all your time. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to John and I at uh, wathub.com. Uh, you can go ahead and click on get started. And from there, we'll get direct access to an account manager. We can find ways of unique ways and customized ways to support you and all your needs. We cover nationwide, so there's no gaps. And uh, if you got anything fun internationally, we'll take a look at it too. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Stay safe. Thank you for all your time.